Thank you for the chance to talk at your Catastrophe and Creativity uh, conference. Um, I did present this at ECU and they've asked me to make us a, a smaller version uh, on video for you. So I'm going to look at New Orleans Christchurch in Japan in the context of this uh, idea of uh, cities that <coughs> go through catastrophe. Uh, if you look at Megiddo in Israel, it's been rebuilt 26 different times. So cities throughout history have had a tough time of it. Some of them make it and some don't. Uh, Ephesus in the Roman Empire was probably the last major city to be abandoned and it's uh, mainly because of the environmental issues in the surrounding hills that meant the river silted up. Pretty much the same happened in Babylon in 2,300 years ago. So cities do collapse and today we have some major events like uh, Hurricane Katrina that almost reduced uh, New Orleans to nothing. And so the theme is how do we rebuild cities and how does creativity help in that process? And New Orleans certainly one of the key reasons it was rebuilt was because of its creativity. It was a great city in the past. It was built in the walking era with sailing ships that came in to the mouth of the uh, uh, Mississippi River uh, and it was a transit city. But the car-based suburbs of recent um, decades, the last 50 years really, were all the ones that were washed away and uh, it's really a big question as to whether they get rebuilt. The uh, devastation was truly dramatic as the, uh, the city dissolved in mountains of water and it dissolved uh, the civil society as well. Now it is a, an unusual city, it is well above, um, the well it's below sea, sea level. The levees here keep the Mississippi out of the main city. Uh, if you look closely at this, the red is the areas that were destroyed, the wetland areas that were destroyed and New Orleans is right at the end of that long skinny thing that sticks out in the Gulf of Mexico. It really is a crazy place to build a city, but it was there because it was um, from the sailing ship era and uh, they uh, didn't go further up the river from there. So the older city um, is, uh, is pretty intact, but rebuilding after Katrina was a big issue. One of the key Things. If you go into the airport, you see this big mural up of the music. Now, music in New Orleans are so synonymous. The uh, Delta Jazz and the, the, the rebuilding of the city was essentially to recognise that creativity. Um, if you go to the uh, French Quarter, that, that hardly got touched. Uh, it, it's out in these suburbs that where the area was destroyed and still basically is. They have Mardi Gras and they were very important to get them started again and this one um, I went to the Mardi Gras ball where the uh, levy board inspectors uh, were tapping around uh, because they were blind. Uh, this sort of sense of humour in disaster is very important and creativity taps into that as is the festivals that, that uh, are so in important to New Orleans and they, they became uh, up and running pretty much within a year. The old trams were reinstated quite quickly and today they have a plan to, to extend the light rail out into other areas. Now the interesting thing is uh, that light rail was seen to be symptomatic of whether this uh, city had a long term future. And the work has begun on this. Where do they get the money from? Just have a look at the money that goes into these amazing uh, bridges and roads in the US. Uh, New Orleans is way out the end of that, uh, that long tip there. It is the city of hope and it is a city that is being rebuilt. Now we've had various terror events. Uh, New Orleans took a while to rebuild and London it was um, pretty dramatic, the bus blowing up and the tube. Um, but immediately 
in the UK, they said, right, let's just get on with this. Put on your bowler hat and your brolly and just bid fear bye-bye. So there was a big campaign. Seven million Londoners won London. And on the tube, you could see things like this where all the uh, multi-faith background, of, uh, the ethnic background um, was celebrated rather than saying this is a, a problem. And Britain's terror alert level has been raised to a point. I like humour when it is helpful in these situations. Now, in our book, Resilient Cities, which um, uh, is an attempt to try and relate to this concept, how do cities bounce back, um, we talk a lot about hope. And hope is the key word here because cities that are in despair after a terrible event have to generate a long-term sense of their future, otherwise they just keep going down. The long-term future for any city today is to recognise the new green economy. The green economy is emerging and any city that doesn't take this on is going to be struggling. So the, it's not unusual therefore to find that in cities that are hit with a catastrophe, they use the chance to rebuild themselves towards the green economy. Now business models change, uh, energy sources change, and transport models, uh, modes change. And all of these are part of the change process that needs to be generated in any city. And each wave is usually associated with some kind of creativity paradigm or approach. So this is my basic message. Every city needs to be renewed. And it needs to be disturbed enough to enable that change to happen. Now the hope in a city that is in chaos because of a catastrophe is that it will be given an extra boost to rebuild itself in these new directions rather than continuing the old ways. That's where the hope comes from. Now creativity, the role of creativity is to unlock the will to make such changes to rejoice in the fact that they are disturbed and they have a chance now to rebuild. So in my book we look at seven different city types and all of these are important like zero carbon cities and which are being built in other parts of the world. The distributed city which is all about localised infrastructure, co-generation, lots of examples we show even in Perth um, and the interesting thing is that when you uh, see some of these chaos cities like in New Zealand and Japan now, um, they're now saying let's get some of this new localised technology. Uh, and some of the statements about that are here. The biophilic city is where you rebuild using much more natural systems like green walls and green roofs as in Singapore. And I've got lots of examples of that that I can talk about. And finally the sustainable transport city where we find that car use is now beginning to go down and public transport is going up everywhere including Australian cities and that the global growth is now in rail particularly in China and India in the Middle East uh, and in many places now light rail is coming in and light rail is a bit of a symbol of a long-term future. Now we've been through a similar kind of chaotic process here. They closed our railway down. That sparked a whole civil society action. There's me at the last train to Fremantle with family and friends trying to stop it. And we got it back again and now we've electrified and, and developed to the north and the south in a very popular way. The next phase of this is light rail. It's part of the psyche of cities like ours that we need to take on the future. So I'm going to just take that background and apply it in Christchurch and the Japanese coastal cities. Christchurch, um, a coastal, um, on the coastal plain in the southern island of New Zealand, on the 22nd of February 2011, massive earthquake hit. 
and it was in fact a reasonably sized one when you look at a sideways movement but in terms of a vertical force it was the highest ever recorded and they've had 8,000 earthquakes since 185 people were killed over a thousand CBD buildings destroyed 10,000 houses destroyed and a third of houses damaged so it was pretty severe now the codes require planning for a 500 year event this was a 2,500 year event, so no one really was ready. And it would have totally flattened any city. The liquefaction process, the squeezing of the earth, uh, created 400,000 tonnes of silt. And we went on a tour around the city in the red zone with a guy called Jason Mill. And the, one of the first things he said to me was, it's a fantastic time to be in Christchurch. The transition is full of wonderful opportunities. Now that's the kind of creative response that you need in any uh, rebuilding process. And he was a real leader in this process um, in the past and, and, and now into the future. Let me show you this picture here. It just looks like a pleasant riverside area, but in fact there was a building there. And if you look at this picture, on the left is that, um, that dome. And on that site is one of the biggest disasters. It was declared safe to occupy after the earlier earthquake, but the Pine Ghoul building was in fact the place where 18 people died. Now, Jason was a very creative architect who knew that building and he recognised where you had to dig to find survivors. And 11 people were hauled out of that wreckage because of his doing. Now, it's a, a city that's rebuilding slowly. This is one of the first buildings to rise from the ashes. Um, beautiful old buildings like this are still coming down. They, they will be destroyed. Now, before it was um, a gentle kind of European centre. Uh, this is part of it when I was there before. And they're about to extend the old tram down this way, but it, the week before it was due to open was the earthquake. And so this uh, this is a picture from before with the old tram and the cathedral. Now the cathedral was also a very iconic symbol. It's been destroyed and a lot of the hope seemed to go with that. The World War II statue next to it with a girdle and a neck brace. It's rather symbolic. Some of the buildings have survived because they were strengthened. Um, inside uh, Jason showed us how some of that happened and, and they did survive but most of it went. And this is where the Arts District was. So the Arts District lost all its performing centres and its office space and uh, art galleries and so on. This building disappeared. And you know they're trying desperately to save a few of them, but really they're gone. This building was saved, it's uh, Bordello. Um, this is uh, the CTV building where 118 people died, mostly children and a lot of Japanese children who were studying there. This is what it was like before, just absolutely uh, wreckage everywhere. And it's now being just swept up and recycled. Now, the liquefaction is the other part of this story. It oozes out and just completely ruins buildings um, because they're swimming in mud and it, you're left with this kind of thing so everything skew if buildings were filled with two feet of mud and everyone had to just leave very quickly so they're still tearing down a lot of these now the liquefaction occurred all along the river as well and if you drive along that river now you see where they really shouldn't have had houses before next to the river and they're all going to be removed because a lot of the river just uh, started up again in the small streams that had been covered over. Uh, it was a pretty severe uh, event when you see what happened to that metal bridge. And these houses, they don't look too bad, but then you look a bit closer and see that it's, it's totally bent. And occasionally the river rose above the levees. 
Bexley is a suburb that was virtually destroyed by liquefaction, completely covered in this, and there you can see it. If you go there now, it's all abandoned, apart from the odd person who tries to stop the rubber necks like me going there. But it was built next to a wetland, and that wetland really uh, should have been more... People should have taken more notice of the fact that you shouldn't build next, right next to a wetland because that whole s suburb is now going to be abandoned. On the coast, Sumner and other places uh, were perched on the beautiful slopes with views out over the ocean. And uh, when, you, when I went there before, you can see uh, it was a pretty popular place to be. But not now. The cliff edges just fell away and houses dropped in all kinds of directions. So you go there now and you've got a lot of abandoned houses perched right on the edge and many of them will never be possible to rebuild. So you've got rows of um, containers holding back the cliff. So what's happening? The green shoots are coming. They have a program called Greening the Rubble where school kids, university kids go in and help clean up. Now that was something that was put together in the first few weeks. It's very creative exercise, very voluntary and lots of these sites are still there where you can see them reclaiming some of the, the places. The Gap Filler Trust set up to bring colour into the city. Where there's colour and creativity people respond with some hope. And that is happening all across the city as they paint and wrap things up and make them look good. They had pop-up dance floors and concerts. They even had a pop-up cinema, cycle-powered, and pop-up offices that people could use. Pop-up pianos, painted, appeared on these vacant sites. Pop-up wall paintings and instant libraries. Very creative, very colourful and a sense of hope generated from it. And the recovery, um, when we were there, the, the Crusaders had just won their first uh, rugby game on their new oval after the event. And this is the or original stadium and uh, it's been destroyed. So they had to build a new one and they built it in a hundred days. Now, you can say, why put your priority onto that? Well, if you've ever lived in New Zealand, you know their priority is pretty high when it comes to rugby. And the CBD, which was totally destroyed, they put aside a, an area and created a pop-up mall where traders can now work out of containers as they try to rebuild the city. And they were asked what they want for the future. What was the number one item? light rail. So they have planned a green, low, dense, compact, diverse and accessible central city and all of the public events were about sustainable transport and light rail. Something they would never have had before, it's now top of the agenda as they rebuild a more hopeful future and there's lots of studies and so on going on about that. And they want to be more like Copenhagen. Well, that's not such a bad goal. This is one of the creative responses. Also, a person who's put together an amazing iPad that can, uh, with a software that will enable you to point it at any site and it'll show you what was there as well as what's being planned to go there. And you can move it around the site. Finally, the Japanese coastal cities, which are another story. This was on the 11th of March 2011, very shortly after, just three weeks after the um, New Zealand one. Um, it was a nine magnitude earthquake. And it was one of the f five biggest earthquakes in the history of the world. The tsunami created reached 40 metres high and went 10 kilometres inland especially along the northern coastal cities, about 400 kilometres of coast. And that dropped 0.6 of a metre. The whole of Japan shifted 2.4 metres towards North America. 
Well, there were thousands died. There's still nearly 3,000 people missing. The trauma must be amazing. And nearly a, a million buildings were either partially destroyed or totally destroyed. As well as that, you had the Fukushima nuclear meltdown, which was enormous loss of face and trust in the authorities. The World Bank said it's the, the most expensive natural disaster in world history. Now, if you look at the, the um, picture of the woman here, she can't even face looking at it. Her world is disappearing. And the trauma of that is very hard to underestimate, I think. The whole place was washing away and burning. If you look at a map, these are the little coastal cities in Japan in the north, all of which were impacted. They are tiny because it's a very mountainous area and you just have these small coastal inlets. Now if you look at the top picture, that's what it was before and then after, it's all gone. So the low-lying areas just washed away. Now I have been to Japan a few times and talked to authorities, but my son Sam, shown here, was able to go to the coastal areas just last month because um, he wanted to have a look and we had a friend who's one of the planners in that area. So she uh, was able to take him up and show him around. Now this guy he met and he wanted him to see his little restaurant and how it was now. He lives above it there and you can see the, the uh, place below is where they were eating. And this is what it looked like before. It was completely underwater. But he's got this back and running, producing beautiful food like this, a very creative process, and he's very keen to, to re-establish himself. So let me start by saying that process is underway, but uh, mostly they're still overwhelmed. Because if you look at this picture here, you think that's the river just flowing along there and that, that's the bank of the river, but it's not. In fact, those buildings are way up on the top of a huge embankment and it was about 40 metres uh, that, the, that that water had suddenly risen. So this whole area down here where the photo is taken from uh, was just washed away. They've re-established the power and that's it. Most of it has gone and if you look down there, uh, that's the uh, devastation. On the right there is a building which just got picked up and deposited a few hundred metres down the road. The power to do that with a massive building. All around, Sam found people praying, essentially still traumatised, still in shock, and feeling as though their main response should be one of quietness and reflection. This place, for example, was a school, um, and it is now a shrine because all the 70 children in there tried to get from the top of the roof where it was not going to be safe enough and walk up that hill there, but they didn't make it before the wave came. And you can see the power of that wave. Just washed so much away. Now, this is the town hall where a famous event occurred because a woman uh, stayed on the phones ringing people to warn them uh, while her mare went up the top of the building and then the, that was being washed away so he climbed up to the top of the, the tower there, that little tower, and clung there for two days before he was rescued. And that same area was depositing buses on tops of th third storeys of buildings. So you look down there and you see they are rebuilding, but it's mostly taking the top of the mountain off from both sides and filling that area in and building the city up on the top of the hills. So the yellow parts now are where they are rebuilding the city, away from the coastal area. So up the top there, not down on the bottom part. It's very traumatic to have to rebuild on an area like that. Now this bridge goes across there and just disappears. It doesn't have a road the other way because it's all gone and it, in fact the road went straight across to that other side. 
it looks like a river there now. Well, it's, it's just that whole area just got filled in by the ocean and has remained because it dropped 6.6 of a metre. This was a railway line, completely abandoned now. They've not rebuilt it. Um, and this is warning people from running on the railway. Well, they've got a boat next to it now. And this was the station. Pop-up um, takeaways, a uh, very big part of China, of Japanese society. Uh, they came back pretty quickly. But most of the area that looks like New Orleans just swept away, the few odd houses left. And a lot of the cities being cleaned up still, mountains of, of recycling. Some of it is being recycled and uh, returned. This is a good source of iron ore. And uh, this is a story about the uh, Japanese whaling towns, several of them in those northern areas, uh, that have been severely hit. And a part of the reason why Japan has announced a cessation of whaling for this year, but many people think it will never go whaling again. Uh, and this uh, whaling place, uh, this is one of the fishing boats that have been fixed up very quickly. Um, this is what the town was like before, and this is what it is now. It's uh, devastated, really. This was a symbol of the whaling era, because it was a massive tank painted and it covered, it carried um, their whale oil. It got swept away. And if you look carefully there, it says, we, uh, we are all one. And in English. So obviously it's meant to say something about that global situation, maybe about whaling, but also about how we're in this together. I asked Sam to look for colour. This was the only building he found where there was some colour, where there was a little bit of attempt to, 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 to say, yes, we have a bit of a future here. Um, and it was in English as well, the home. I don't know what that means. But mostly, the cities have shrines everywhere. Now, I dare say the creativity process is bubbling away and helping to rebuild these towns but it is probably too early still. They are still in shock and trauma. And until you can get through that phase, it's very hard to be too creative. So I believe the creative process will happen there and they will rebuild, but uh, there is a severe point of transition they're going through still. Thank you very much.